Hey everyone, I'm Tammy Sollenberger, the author of The One Inside, 30 Days to Your Authentic Self. This podcast is for anyone curious about who they are, the different parts of themselves, and for those who want to connect with their true self. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. I am so excited today to be with Martha Sweezy. Martha has written all the IFS books with all the people. And how many books, how many books is it? Like eight, eight or nine? Something like that. I, I can't, I can't remember. <laughs> eight or nine IFS books and has a new book out. So I'm super excited to talk about new book, but let's start where we always start which is where you are in the world and what you would see if you look out your nearest window. Uh, I'm in South Portland, Maine, uh, where I just moved from Northampton, Mass. And if I were to stand up and look out the window fully, um, I would have a little, I would look at some trees and some houses and a little peak of Casco Bay. Nice, nice. So we were talking about how we're actually not that far from each other. We're probably only 45 minutes from each other. Right. You're just yeah. down the road. Yeah. yeah. And it is beautiful. I'm in New Hampshire and it is a beautiful day. It's cool. It's starting to cool off a little bit, which I don't love, but it's okay. I just went swimming. Oh, you did? Are, are you a cold water swimmer? Well, I, I, swimming is a bit of an exaggeration. I went into the water for a few minutes <laughs> it's cold <laughs> but well, I like so, how it feels afterwards so. yeah yeah I mean did you go all the way did you submerge your body into the water or did you just put your feet yeah. in okay, then no, that's I, swimming I, I mean if you put your body in it well if you do the crawl for a while it's swimming but if you just dunk <laughs> and jump around it's... I think the same thing is like baking right like if I put something in the oven then I baked. It doesn't matter if I just dumped it in a bowl and added water and stirred it up. That's baking. <laughs> you get credit. I do get credit. I turned the oven on. <laughs> so you get credit for, for swimming. All right. I'll take it. Yeah. Take it. Take it. Are, have you always loved swimming? I do. I love, I love the water. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're closer yeah. to it, much closer to it. Yeah. On purpose. Yeah. I, I, um, I liked, you know, the Western Mass, but it's, but I'm really a uh, beach, ocean, shore person. Yeah, yeah. Me too. We were just down, yes, last night we were down in Hampton Beach and saw the fireworks and um, it was beautiful. Just being yeah. down there is great. Yeah. So you wrote this new book and I've, I'm curious about a couple of things. I think this probably is Part of me is like, this is a stupid question, but I'm curious why you felt like this book needed to be written. Ah, well, um, that's my whole career. Uh, I started off um, in this field in uh, 1987, and that was my first observation was that um, this book needed to be written. I didn't know what it was yet, (laughs) but that was kind of what I, what immediately grabbed me was um, the work of people who were working on, who were focusing on research on emotion and, uh, and particularly at that time more in a, of an emphasis on guilt, uh, the people I was interested in, but then I got interested in the people who were looking at shame as well. So, so when you entered the field, like entered the the mental health field, that was something that stuck out, stuck out to you is how we're all, how we all, and I thought, obviously we would say like, we all have these really prevalent shame and guilt parts. And so even kind of before you were doing IFS and thought of it that way, that's what really stuck out to you. Right. Stuck out to me as people would talk to me when I first started sitting with people was gee, you know, this, seem, this seems to be a, around a lot, a lot of that sort of self-blame, self-conscious yeah. emotion stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. And why, um, and so again, I feel like I, I'm going to say this is a stupid question again, but why does it warrant its own book? Like, cause it's funny. Mm-hmm. This, is what, this is why I'm asking the question. Right. I feel like I get asked this a lot. Like, how do we do a, deal with shame? 
Mm-hmm. And I sometimes am like, well, why wouldn't we deal with the shame is the same way we would deal with any part that had any feeling. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering if you feel like we need to deal with it differently, or if there's a, just a different something that warrants, let's have this conversation than this book about shame and guilt. It like, it warrants its own book and time and energy. Well, yeah, um, that's a great question. And I definitely think it warrants its own book and time and energy. Um, uh, Partly because if you say the word shame, people often want to get up and leave the room, right? And so it's a topic that uh, actually therapists sometimes more than clients and the clients come in and they're eager to have somebody say it's okay to have this conversation and therapists are more care can be more careful around is it okay to bring up these this issue with less so now i think than in the past but um so um there's a lot of I, there's a lot of reason to differentiate guilt from shame, which I talk about in the book. And there's a lot of reason to understand these two emotions in the context of psychic multiplicity, to understand how, how trauma becomes traumatic over time and how an external insult becomes an internal identity and process. And I think understanding those things will help sort of help me as a clinician. You know, it took me, I mean, I, of course I have a part, something will take me years to, to kind of figure out. And then I have a part who goes, well, everybody knows that. <laughs> so this part is like, you know, and I, I know it's not true, but this part, as soon as I figure something out and it's really clear to me, I have a part who goes, ah, that's no big deal. Everybody but else I, I knows do that. Actually, You're everyone, late to the everyone, party. Right. Yeah, everyone knows this. But <laughs> um, but actually, I don't think everybody knows this. And so that's why I wrote the book. Um, I, it was extremely important to me clinically to understand. Um, it, it just speeds things up for my, me and my clients and has been very clarifying in my life personally. Okay, so, great. Yeah. So tell me, can you tell, tell me and tell us um, the difference between shame and guilt and how it speeds things up? And and, okay. and yeah. I would love to hear because I have parts that are very nosy, i.e. curious, and I would love to hear how it has sped things up for you in your own work, in your own life. Okay. So what was the first part of that? What was it? How, what's oh, the sometimes I ask like three questions at the same yeah. time. Um, okay. cause I just get excited. Well, yeah, what's what's the difference the di- between shame and guilt? Yeah. Okay. So, um, shame is a global assessment of personal value, right? And guilt is an assessment of behavior. So guilt is I did wrong. And the action urge that attends on guilt is repair. If I say it's a very relational emotion. So if I feel guilty, the urge I have inside and in parts language, we would say I have a a conscience part of part who's saying, hey, look, you just hurt Sally over there and you need to go do something about that. You can't just walk away from this. You have to take responsibility or you will lose this relationship and you're and and you'll hurt somebody. It's not okay. Right. So Guilt is a very relational um, emotion. Now, that said, it gets a little more complicated because guilt is only um, appropriate at times, right? Mm -hmm. If you really transgress, which we all do at times, um, then guilt is a really useful thing to feel. You want to know, you want, it's the message, you know, mm-hmm. hey, wait, hey, that wasn't okay. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to go back and do something about that. Um, that's how we repair the tears in our, our social tears, right? Um, but there's also what we could call maladaptive guilt, which is if you feel guilty for pursuing normal developmental goals, even though 
somebody else doesn't like it or tells you that you're hurting them by doing that, right? Or yeah. you. So there's two kinds of maladaptive guilt, survivor guilt and separation guilt. Those are the two kinds that are mainly defined. And so survivor guilt is if I'm happy and successful or, you know, doing something that pursuing something in a way that pleases me and I'm doing well and I'm pursuing my developmental goals appropriately, uh, I am hurting or I will hurt if I do that somebody for whom I am responsible or for who, who I love. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that, when that issue comes up, it's very inhibiting for people, especially kids, you know, if they have, say, a depressed parent or, you know, a, they're parentified in some way and they, and they start giving up their normal developmental goals as a sacrifice in order to take care of somebody who should be taking care of themselves mm -hmm. um, because they have this maladaptive guilt. And that's really common. And one of the reasons it's important to understand that clinically and understand it in terms of parts um, is that, uh, you know, in IFS, we talk about um, protectors having a good intention, having good intentions. But actually, these protectors have a good intention for somebody else. Ooh, okay. Right. Yeah. And they, they start off often... If I can just get, if I can take care of this parent, then the parent will, will offer a little parenting. So that would be good. Yeah. But they get recruited into this position where they're actually sacrificing the needs of their own system, the system which they are actually not protecting at that point. So that they do not, they're, they're less interested in seeing that exile be healed than you might wish they would be when you're trying to help that client. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that make sense? Totally, totally. Yeah, that it, sometimes I think of it as like, if I'm feeling guilty, let's say with something about my mom, and then sometimes I just, um, let's say it's something simple, like, you know, I need to call my mom and I'm feeling guilty. I haven't called my mom in a while. And sometimes I'm like, just call your mom because it'll make her happy and make me feel less guilty. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's sort of like, okay, I need to just sort of like, it'll make her happy. It'll take care of the guilt. So just do the thing. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right. So sometimes it's just, but if, but if, but if, <laughs> if it was a huge sacrifice on your part to make that call, right. Then yeah. it would begin to be a more fraught issue for you. Right. Yeah. Usually, okay. Call your mom. You might be busy, but you do it, but yeah. it's not like you're giving up your life or your opportunities to right. do that. Like don't but there are kids who do that, Yeah, you know, yeah. and they come to therapy very torn because um, we're saying, help yourself. We want you to help yourself. And they're saying, but that's exactly what I can't do. You don't understand. You know, yeah. the parts who are stuck on that will really get in the way of progress in therapy. And you have to attend to them before you try to go for the exiles because they have a special dilemma, basically. So yeah, that makes it pays sense. to be able to identify per the dilemmas of parentified protectors. Okay, yeah. that's one thing. <laughs> okay, that's about guilt. Um, and um, the shame is what we find with exiles, right? Usually, not always. Sometimes an exile gets tucked away and it's a perfect little beauty who never is innocent and is, has no idea that something bad is going on around and the protectors are taking all the hits, you know, but often mm -hmm. an exile has burdens and the burdens are, I am right. Not I did, but I am yeah. bad, mm -hmm. inadequate, too much, too little, unlovable, blah, blah, blah. Right. Yeah. That's what we find. Yeah. And that's the, you know, what I call the, the turtle at the bottom of the pile, you know, the yurtle, the turtle is that little exile who's like being crushed. Mm -hmm. and um, has that belief and hopes it's not true, would like somebody to say that's absolutely not true, but they have no evidence because protectors have taken in the insult and had no way of really, uh, well, if they had no way of rejecting it, 
you know, um, some obviously many of us get insulted as kids in various ways and we don't take it in and we don't accept it. Like, okay, you know, my big brother told me that having curly hair was terrible. Well, you know, ha ha, I don't agree with him. Um, everybody in school wishes they had curly hair, you know, so that wouldn't land, right? right yeah. But if it landed in some way that felt true, then protectors get on board. And they they then take what is an external insult and they begin, managers who mean well, right, begin to uh, uh, try to improve or hide the part who draws fire in that way, mm. right? And, the, and they do it because they're young and they don't understand irony. They, they try to prevent you from feeling shameful by shaming the part who already got shamed right? yeah. and they and they often do it relentlessly and they as you know as ifs trainers will teach on and on you know they protectors always get exactly what they're trying to avoid yeah. um, so managers become active they they go from it happened to now I am, they, per they perpetrate this identity internally uh, rather than being able to reject it. Um, so they're the opposite of cheerleaders, right? They think of themselves as cheerleaders, but they're the opposite, right? They're doomsayers mm. and, they're, uh, and they kind of crush uh, the more vulnerable parts in order to be safe. And, and then in response, of course, we get eventually, you know, there's all this inhibition that they're trying to impose. And then eventually we get disinhibition because of that balancing act. It's impossible to live by inhibition alone. You end up wanting to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. Suicide parts come up and become active. So, mm -hmm. um, and they are, you know, that's their hyper-focus is, is, uh, is shamefulness, right? If the shamefulness becomes too, uh, prominent in the conscious mind um, then a suicide part will come in and and take action mm. right so so other firefighters are trying to protect against that and they are shameless they will do anything <laughs> to mm. not have that fate right so yeah. so it's so there's there's shame as a verb really is what happens and we can understand that best in my view by understanding that the mind is not singular you know as soon as you you understand that this is how the mind is actually functioning uh shame becomes a cycle not a a thing it's not a fog that descends over somebody it's an active process that mm -hmm. is going on inside of them that is perpetuating uh, an external injury mm -hmm. uh, in a way that traps has trapped the person yeah. and that in ifs that's what we're helping people get out of you know because the self right of course has a different perspective well you know protectors don't know how to get out of this because they believe it they think something is wrong and they think they have to fix the exile or change it or shut it up or hide it or whatever and the self comes along as like hey Hey guys, I know that hurt. I know that was an insult. I know you believed it at the time and you had no way of getting out of believing it, but actually it wasn't true. There's nothing wrong with this little guy. They're fine. I'm going to, I got this, you know, and then you take the air out of the tire uh, that's been running this, this dreadful um, show for years and years. You know, there's a ton has been written on shame. There are a lot of clinicians and researchers and people who are talking about shame who have a lot to say about shame. And, you know, so I'm entering into a field that's rich with a lot of that people have said and, and are and are looking at. Um, but what I and and I said to myself at the beginning of my career, I am not, you know, I was a writer already, but I said, I'm not gonna. Do well. I'm not going to have a career writing professionally unless I think I can say something that other people aren't already saying. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'll go write fiction or something. I'm just not going to do that. I'm not going to, you know, you know, get paid per 
you know, per the word for my academic career, it's not happening. So, so it wasn't until I got to IFS that I really got interested in, because I thought, now this is something that there isn't enough written about from things we have not seen things, you know, there, 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 there were a few treatment approaches, which there had been for quite a while using psychic multiplicity as the base, which were great, but the whole, the whole field of mental health hadn't been explored enough from that perspective for, you know, so it was a, the barn door was wide open from my perspective. And I thought, okay, I'll jump in, you know, this is what I want to write about. Yeah. So that circles me, that circles me back to this part of you that said, when you figure something out or you have some clarity and you have a part that says, oh, everybody knows that already. That's so interesting because you had another part or sort of maybe the same group of parts that were like, I'm not going to write about things that everybody already knows. Right. That's true. It's a big contradiction. (laughs) (laughs) I think the one who says everybody knows that already is trying to protect me from being disappointed if nobody's interested in what I have to say, you know? So I think it's just a, a protector who comes in. If I get really excited about something, this, ah, don't get so excited, you know? Ah, ah come on, everyone knows that. <laughs> Otherwise you'd be walking awful. around and being like, oh, everyone should swim in the water, blah, 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 blah. And they would be like, hey, d- shame me. They would insult you and shame you and say, everybody already knows that. Martha. Exactly. <laughs> what are you so excited about, right? <laughs> So this part really is my older siblings did when I was (laughs) the youngest, you know, why do you say? Oh, okay. Okay. (laughs) You would just discover something when you were little and all your older siblings would be looking at you like, "Mm." they were like, yeah, they would like sit on me. (laughs) Like, oh, shut up. (laughs) They're very nice now. We're all good friends, but (laughs) I love it. But I think you're right. That like, that's the, the insult can, if there's, if there's a trigger point for it or sort of a, a point for it, right? If someone says something to me about having curly hair, right? I don't, my hair can sometimes be wavy, but it's not curly necessarily. So like, yeah, you can pick on me for having curly hair all you want to. It's not going to land on me. There's no right. trigger point for it. Right. Um, but when there is, right, there are all these, especially when someone insults right. me and it taps one of my sweet little exiles, those little turtles that are hidden down at the bottom and I hear the same thing or somebody says a whole bunch of words, but I just hear the words that echo one of my exiles, then I'm going to have a different experience of that. Yeah. I mean, and and you're already down the road from the initial insult. I mean, the initial insult can be, you know, I went to school and my shoes were three sizes bigger than all the other girls and somebody commented on it and said, boy, you have big feet for an eight-year-old or something like that, right? And yeah. then forever after, I wanted to hide my feet, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and nobody else would notice that as a big thing. But that's one way in which the, there, there's the beginning of a constraint in terms of that child's feelings about their body and what they're allowed to show and what they feel embarrassed about, you know, and those things build up. It's not just your feet. It's, you know, uh, can I, am I reading as fast as the other kids? And am I good at math or good at science or good at English or whatever, you know, there's always something that you're not going to, you know, you're not going to be as good at or as the other kids or you're, you're going to be different in some way. And that's always there right there. That gap is always a, a potential for shaming. Yeah. Yeah. And feeling shameful, you know, the shaming comes both when it's, it's a cycle because other people who have protectors will throw the hot potato in somebody else's direction, you know, in order to say, well, you're the shameful one, not me. Yeah, right. Older right. siblings do that. To younger siblings, so kids do, peers do it to each other. Teachers do it to kids etc. Parents do it to kids, right? So it, what goes around comes around. That um, blaming, you're sort of, you're saying that blaming hot potato, that sort of we're throwing blame. Well, so if I feel shameful, I, I have a pre- firefighter who can change the subject pretty darn fast by making you feel shameful instead yeah. and saying you're the one who's less than, not me. 
and yeah. I'm going to make you feel less than to prove it. And then I'm going to feel bigger in comparison to your small crushed self. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that happens all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And it's I think that we don't realize we're doing it, right? We don't even realize, we don't realize we've been hit by right. it. I don't realize I've been shamed. And then I don't realize I'm now shaming you. Right. And kids do it very blatantly with each other in their social relations. And then when we grow up, we find ways to usually do it much more politely, <laughs> hidden, hidden, except in sometimes in our relationships, you know, we're really close. We're going to get you. <laughs> I just straight up tell you, you have big feet. That's exactly. it. <laughs> and you're wrong. <laughs> and I'm right. Always. I'm right. <laughs> Right. Exactly. Um, what about this idea of um well I had I um my therapist has, has told me sometimes like I don't feel it, I don't feel sort of the hot potato going around until I feel it in my body. Like sort of there's sometimes a mm-hmm. body, like something feels wrong, something feels missed, like I can feel it. Because then sometimes my parts, like we we're just joking about my Sometimes I have naive parts about all kinds of stuff. And, and I feel that way in, in a specific relationship, I sometimes don't know what's going on. And then it takes me a day or two. I'm like, oh, they were insulting me. Like, oh, they were actually trying to be like really rude. (laughs) And what do you notice in your your body? I'd say I feel like sick. Like in the moment, I feel like something's wrong and I don't know what it is. Like I feel a little bit like, ooh, but, oh, okay, whatever. It's sort of like this la, mm-hmm. la, 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 naive part of me. Right. But it's sort of like, a, ooh, uh, what? So uh. you're, the parts of, some parts are registering this, but there's another part that comes in and whitewashes and says, we're not going to notice that yeah. or know what it is. Yeah, right. Yeah. Definitely. And, that, and, that's, and that's, you know, protectors really help us out in all kinds of different ways with, with handling, shaming, that's coming our way and uh, trying to keep us from noticing how our exiles have been, you know, um, hit by that. Yeah, that's good. What about the idea, how to pay attention to what I, and I'm going to put this in quotes, should feel guilty about? Because I feel like, you know, sometimes if I feel bad, like, hey, call your mom, then like, yeah, I should call my mom. But there's sometimes there's sort of like, I feel guilty and I, and I shouldn't, right? Like sort of like if I have mm-hmm. to say, no, I can't, again, these are small mm-hmm. examples, mm-hmm. but right. Like, no, mm-hmm. I don't really, I, could I go to the party? Yes. Mm-hmm. I have nothing planned. I could go to the party. Do I want to go to the party? No. So I might, I might have to, I might have to get to work with a lot of parts, but eventually I will mm-hmm. say, no, I'm not going to go to the party. And then this part of me feels guilty. Like I've done something wrong and I'm disappointing right. people. No one's going to like me anymore. And no right. one's ever so, and so there, you, there you can hear it, right? I mean, that's what that protector is worried about. So it's, it's, it's ramping up the guilt in order to, because it's worried about your social standing. Who are you know is the part of you who who does isn't interested in in going out and socializing tonight, going to ruin your chances for life of ever being liked by anybody again? <laughs> you know, you have a you have a nervous manager. That's what Never. their job is, right? <laughs> managers are our social you know social secretaries yeah and they and they they stand right there with their little notepad saying this is going to be a ding against you if you don't go to the party yeah yeah i love that and and it's you're right it's turning towards turning towards the part that's that's feeling guilty turning towards that part and finding out it's positive intention and finding out like, but I think on, do you, okay. Do you find that unblending from parts that shaming and guilty parts is harder (laughs) than unblending from everybody else? Uh, I think that it often, often is, I mean, uh, you know, but again, you got to stay experienced near people are different. Um, and see what this person who you're sitting with is experiencing and what you are. Um, but I, but managers who, you know, this is their job. This is the core, the heart of their job, right? So, and it's, it, and it's not, in my experience, even once, you know, they sort of relax because the exiles are better and they're like, okay, I'll be a cheerleader and all that. But they're like, but if I have to come back to this, I certainly will. You know, yeah. I, I'm right here. Don't worry. 
I can shame you again if we if it's really becomes important, you know. So it's not like um, you because people you're not going to go. Life isn't safe. And people will insult you and, you know, you're going to run into places where people are going to hurt. They're going to hit the right spot. It's going to hurt, you know, just because you've healed your exiles doesn't mean it's not going to happen again. And you're not going to actually feel some shame and, you know, in addition to some, just some pain. And so when that happens, the question isn't, you know, uh, should I not feel this? The question is, what do I do about it? You know, who, how do I find the, you know, find the party just got hurt and take care of it um, and calm the troops down? Because, you know, when you get shamed, there are all these protectors spring into action. There's the one who wants to, who says, well, you shouldn't have done that. It was your fault, you know, so really you, you're embarrassing. And there's the one mm -hmm. who says, let's just kill that person. <laughs> You know, yeah, we'll, we're going to get them, sense. you know, yeah. we'll find a way. There's the revenge. Yeah. And then there's the one who says, well, we should just actually go hide and never go to a party again or something. And, you know, so they all get into action and you have to not just, you know, look for the exile look or, or the part who's newly hurt, but you also have to calm all of them and say, look, there's no need for action right now. And nothing, you guys can just, you know, pull up an armchair. It's okay. I've got this. And that is a practice that you do over time. You learn to do over time in my experience. Yeah. Um, you don't but have to partly do you learn not to take it so seriously. Oh, how do you do that? I want to know um, how to do that. <laughs> that's one of the reasons I wrote the book. You know, you, 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 you really, you, you, you want to get out of the, the sort of ba uh, bear hug of the shame cycle. And be able to step back and say, yeah, 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 well, of course, yeah, that felt shaming, but hey, it's not the end of the world, you know, I'm really okay, and mm -hmm. I can handle this, and I'm going to jump in and take care of my parts. Mm. That right there is beautiful, right? Like, if 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 we can get out of the bear hug, I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, I got big feet, and I stink too, yeah, okay, yeah, and then, but then, right. But but then also go to the parts and I'm not trying to make light of it. Like, um, but yeah, because when it does feel so serious and so intense and so real, right? I yeah. am unlovable and I am awful and I am bad and I should I should either kill you or kill me, but one of us right. is going down. Like something's right. gonna happen. Like that feels right. really awful. And I am the only person who ever felt this, you know, when you get once you appreciate hey, this is just what had the human condition yeah right yeah um i'm curious and you don't have to answer this martha because we never talked about it but i'm curious if you you said this is a practice like this is a practice of unblending and being with our parts and um so i'm curious if you have a do you have a daily practice or how do you check in with your parts um i'm just curious you don't again you don't have to answer but i'm curious if you it, have a practice it's not so much a I mean, I do have a practice, but it's not so much like a meditation practice as it is a continual sort of how how am I do how is everybody doing at different points in the day if there's some you know transition or something important happens or or um, you know sort of just constantly trying to notice um, how's everybody where, doing you know who's yeah. here what does anyone need. Yeah. And what do you, you know, thoughts come up? Oh, hi. You know, there you are. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I love that. So it's a, it's sort of an ongoing, just, just listening, paying attention, who's here saying hi, which I love. It's just a great unblending, just saying hi. Okay. Yep. I see you. Right. Yeah. yeah. What about compassion? You talk about compassion and that's something that's that I'm curious how that comes with its connection to shame and guilt, compassion. Well, in the book, I have a chapter on the difference between empathy and compassion, which I won't go into detail here. But but the the punchline, as we know from IFS, is that compassion is the opposite of feeling shameful you know, it's the opposite of shaming, for one thing, having compassion is the opposite of shaming someone. 
and ha- and being in a state of compa- self compassion is the opposite of uh, suffering from shamefulness um, because you know as soon as exiles uh, I mean in the language of IFS it's you know as soon as exiles attach to self um, they are you know sort of have a big bathtub of compassion to jump into or swimming pool or something and and uh, or a bay or or bay bay. yeah beautiful (laughs) ocean yeah actually and um and they're not um you know in the desert anymore so Mm -hmm. yeah and i find that like i'm thinking of a client that i have right now that just just getting her to unblend or separate it all from the guilt parts that hold guilt is because she so identifies with them um so there's no no compassion right compassion for other people for sure but no compassion for herself and and then you want to explore i i I think i mean who who, you want to ask the part directly who would you be hurting if you stop if you laid off with this routine you know who who are you worried about because it's not the client it's somebody else Oh, I love that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Who are you protecting? And so I don't, uh, you can ask, uh, you know, what part, are you protecting another part? But another way of putting that is just who are you protecting? It's more open-ended yeah. because the parentified parts aren't, are protecting somebody else. Yeah, that's good. That's good. And that actually makes sense in this case. That, that, that so makes sense. Yeah. Um. And so tell me about... Um, which I know we talked a little bit about this, about psychic multiplicity. Ah, well, psychic multiplicity is, you know, having parts, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, um, if you, if you don't, if you think of the mind as singular, none of this makes sense. Right. But if you, uh, it's shame and guilt are both what are called self-conscious emotions and you can't, have an awareness, uh, want one thing judging another without at least two, right? So you're already into multiple here. There's at least two. There's at least two. And, you know, and and that's certainly true of any, um, like, you know, uh, psychodynamic thinking. Dynamic means, psychodynamic means conflict, internal conflict. And if you have internal conflict, you've got more than one. And so that's why Freud talked about id, ego, and superego. And Marshall Linehan talks about wise mind, reasonable mind, and uh, emotion mind, right? Yeah. So, th- so all these folks are dealing with multiplicity, even though they don't say that explicitly. Um, they're just dealing with it in the aggregate as opposed to uh, approaches that are more experienced near like IFS and talk about, you know, go to the person's subjective experience and and who's there, you know. And IFS is very personifying. Uh, well, it's not, we're not doing the personifying, the clients are doing the personifying. You know, some do, some don't. Some people will say, I just have a lot of colors whirling around, but many will have a little figure there who's talking to them, right? Um, so. Um, and do you feel like it sounds like that that um, this latest book that you wrote, it it is talking about shame and, and guilt in in the context of multiplicity, where the other books and the research books right. um, about shame, they're, they're not talking about multiplicity in the way that IFS does and the way that you do. Right. Although there is, you know, uh, what's his name, who I should have his name at the tip of my tongue, who was so popular on pbs who did uh, the shame that binds you are you going to remember his name for me um i'm blanking on it anyway he wrote a very he wrote a book that was extremely popular i think he was related to aa and he had a show on on um wgbh i think that was very popular healing the shame that binds you are you looking it up What's his name? John Bradshaw. John Bradshaw. And he had a TV show. And, you know, this was way back, maybe even the 70s or something. And 
I reread his book. I didn't read a lot right before writing this because I had over the years read quite a bit, but I didn't want, I wanted to write something that was more clinical and based on my experience with IFS rather than researchy. Um, so, but John Bradshaw uh, got a lot of, of, you know, he talked about the inner child and he got a lot of what, um, uh, of a sort of very ifs -y perspective, except that he was into kind of fighting the protectors. Okay, yeah. yeah. You know? And so that's one thing that Dick has really, Dick and his trainers and, uh, you know, all the people he's worked with have brought very strongly uh, into the field, which is, you do, you know, these are good parts. They're just children. They're not trying, they're not somebody you have to fight with. In fact, fighting with them just makes matters worse. Um, they don't need to be managed or contained or controlled. Yeah. They need they need to be loved or shamed, <laughs> and they don't need yeah all that stuff is shaming yeah <laughs> right right right. Well, as soon as they're trying to save people, and then treaters come in and shame them for that, and it's not productive. And yeah. Bradshaw made that mistake, uh, but otherwise he was very much on track with what, what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, well, I am so excited. So the new book is called IFS for Shame and Guilt. Um, what are you working on now? Uh, well, I'm working with um, Nancy Soul on a book on IFS and, and chronic illness in the body. Um, and I'm working with um, Dick and uh, uh, two other people on a book on um on uh, IFS when in psychedelics. Um, and um, um, what else am I working on? Um, speaking about the shame book going around and, and talking about it. Um, there's a lot of, it's, they had to go into a second printing much faster than they thought. So it's, it's selling really well. And, and I've been getting invitations from various parts of the world to come and talk. So I want to do that. Yeah. The last question that I love to ask everybody is if you weren't doing all you're doing, if you weren't doing all the writing and the traveling and the therapy and mm -hmm. all and helping people author books too, um, what would you like to do instead? Well, um, you know, I always wanted to do some things that I had no um, particular facility for. So I would, you know, be a musician or I would be a mathematician or I would be, you know, a uh, uh, widely capable athlete or, you know, there's all these things <laughs> that I look at other people who, who are doing them and I think, oh, I would love to do that. So just do the things I'm not good at. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Well, thank you so much, Martha. This has been fun. How can people find you? They wanted to reach out and, and well, I have a website and they can just go to the website and there's contact information on the website. Great. And I love to hear uh from people and uh they read the book. I'm happy to answer questions or whatever. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. This was fun. It's good to talk to you. Thank you, Tammy. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like this episode, please subscribe, rate, like, all the things. My book is available at your favorite independent bookstore or all the places books are available. You can also visit my website, TammySallenberger.com, where you can download a free meditation on getting to know your should parts. You know, there's parts of you who remind you of what you should be doing. They sound a bit critical at times. Yes, we all have them. You can follow me at IFS Tammy on Instagram and Twitter and the One Inside Facebook page. I'm so grateful for Jack Reardon, who created the new music. Jack is a graduate of Derek Scott's IFS Stepping Stone program. Thanks, Jack, for getting me. And to you, thanks for listening.